Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this COVID-19 update. I'm Teresa Freed, the Assistant Director of Public Affairs and Communications. We have with us Johnson County Department of Health and Environment, Dr. Salmi Ariola, and new to the organization, Deputy Director Charlie Hunt and Epidemiology Director Elizabeth Holshue. And Jeffrey is here providing us ASL. Well, the school year is just around the corner, so we wanted to provide a quick update on the guidance for schools and families. And Dr. Ariola, if you want to go ahead and get us started with that. Thank you, Theresa, and uh, good morning to um, all of our Johnson County residents. Uh, it's, it's been a while, but since we are on here talking, that's, that's because um, we want to provide um, updated information to our residents. And like um, uh, Theresa said, um, our schools are about to, they are preparing to, to, to open. And we want to make sure that uh, we stress what has been our goal from the start, which is to keep our schools open. We absolutely understand the benefits of interactions, social interactions and learning in person. That's why we work with our school, uh, uh, school uh, uh, superintendents last year uh, to keep our schools open. And I thought we, we achieved that goal. Now there were times when for secondary school students, we had to uh, do remote learning and hybrid, but we kept our elementary schools open throughout. The reason we were able to do that, uh, uh, really uh, because the school schools did a good job of creating environments that are really not supportive of the virus spreading. The ventilation was good. They had uh, students uh, wearing masks. There was physical distancing. There was just an awareness of the things that we need to do. They also work with us a lot on ensuring that we quickly identify cases uh, via testing and otherwise, and that when we needed to exclude, isolate or, or quarantine, that they work with us to do that. And again, we were able to avoid uh, uh, outbreaks in a lot of our schools. We were able to keep our schools open. Now, since then, we have had a lot more people vaccinated we have seen the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention even say that those that are fully vaccinated, which is two weeks post your second shot of Pfizer or, 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 or Moderna or the one shot uh, 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 Johnson & Johnson, that you can resume activities that you used to do. And that's been good. But that, that, that guidance was for those that are fully vaccinated. Here's what we have all done. We are all, we've all basically resumed activities, those that are vaccinated and those that are not. And what's going on right now is that we have uh, a spike. We have increased in the increase in number of infections that we are seeing. Now, did we expect increase? Yes, we did, especially since everybody's out. But we also stress that the summer months are our friend. Outdoor, we spend a lot more time in the outdoor environment, which is good. But then there's this uh, wrinkle that came, which again, not unexpected. Uh, the, the variant that's circulating here is the Delta variant. And it is a lot more transmissible. Uh, for uh, mutations around the spike protein that's causing uh, uh, the virus to infect more people and perhaps um, uh, uh, creating a larger viral load, which again causes uh, the, the virus to spread. Elizabeth is going to get into the numbers very soon, but we have been tracking a variants here for several weeks. And the past few weeks, it's become the dominant variant here in Johnson County. There was a week where the entire 40, 42 or 44 samples that we, we sampled, uh, whole genome sequencing, were all the de uh, Delta variant. And so that's there. So we're concerned. Uh, she's also going to talk to you about what we are seeing this summer with outbreaks in our child care establishments, with outbreaks in summer camps. And, and, and so we wanted, again, to make sure that we bring this to, to your attention. There are multiple things that needs to be done. We do need our schools and we've been meeting with our schools and talking with them to continue to do the right things, to create environments that's not conducive for the virus to spread. We do need um, 
uh, very basic measures in place to get more people vaccinated. And, and Charlie is going to get into the details of uh, what's in our guidance as to all the things that, that we need to do. Remember the, uh, the uh, cheese uh, slice uh, cheese model that we talk about? It's going to be a combination of interventions for us to get to where we need to get to. And so we're also talking to parents uh, in terms of wearing masks. The pandemic is here. It is pretty much here. We are seeing a lot more cases than we had, than we did for several, several weeks. And so we're, bring, we're raising that to your, uh, bringing that to your attention, but we are also uh, really going to talk about what steps we're recommending to our schools to take to ensure that one, we can keep our schools open, but two, we can do it in a way that is safe and healthy for our students. And so I will have Elizabeth talk uh, through some of the numbers. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ariola and Teresa. Um, so we are sort of in a situation, as Dr. Ariola said, that is not necessarily unexpected, um, but probably came a little sooner than we were hoping or, or wanting. Um, we are seeing a fairly rapid increase in our cases. Um, at about this time last month, um, as an example, our instance rate was only at about 24 per 100,000 Johnson County residents. And as of today, it's at 144 per 100,000 residents. At that time, a month ago, our percent positive was 1.7%. And today we are at 7%. Um, so really rapid growth in the number of cases and the percentage of our residents who are getting tested, we're testing positive. And we're following some of the same trajectory that we're seeing in other parts of the region. We've all heard about Southwest Missouri and how they're being hit very hard. Um, and as we've looked at the data, what we've really seen is that kids are making up a much greater proportion of our cases, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, particularly those under the age of 12 are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. And we still have fairly low coverage in our 12 to 17 year olds. In Johnson County, the percentage of kids in that age group who are vaccinated fully um, is less than 30%. Um, and we have some zip codes that are as low as 20%. So about one in five um, residents in that age group and you know that secondary school age group are vaccinated fully. Um, and so what this means is that kids um, in five to 17, which made up about 13%, um, a little bit more than one in 10 of our cases through the entire pandemic, now make up three out of 10 of our cases. Um, we're seeing that age group come up, uh, having a lot of infections, and a lot of them are associated with outbreaks. Um, and these include things like childcare centers, summer camps, both day summer camps, as well as those overnight summer camps, um, and other, other gatherings. We've seen it in athletic groups um, as well. And just again, as an example, in the last three months, approximately 50% of our cases, half of our cases in this age group have been associated with outbreaks. And really what's driving this is the Delta variant. We know that Delta is transmitted far more easily from person to person than the virus that we had circulating last year when our kids were going back to school. Um, last year, that virus, that, that variant, the, the wild type, for every one person who was infected, it would in, that person would infect two to three individuals. With Delta, for every one person that's infected, it looks like they can infect up to six to eight additional people. And when you sort of multiply that out as they transmit from the next group to the next group, it becomes very big very quickly. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this, but it's definitely alarming as we're seeing these signs, particularly in this age group. You know, kids are being hospitalized. I spoke to a colleague from Children's Mercy this morning. Um, they have a number of children hospitalized currently, um, a lot of medically fragile children. And what's really frustrating for us, I think, in public health is during the school year last year, we were able to show what worked. Um, while, yes, we ended up having to go remote, particularly for our secondary kids and last fall when we had our highest case counts, that was really driven by the fact that our teachers were getting sick and we didn't have enough staff to keep those schools open. Um, that is not really the case this year. We know how to prevent this disease, and that is through masking. And we now have data both from Johnson County as well as from other areas of the country that show that when kids are masked in a classroom, even if they don't have that distance that we talk about, if they're within those three feet, masks are exceptionally effective. Um, I believe we had about 2000 kids that fell into this category, right? So they were within three feet of a kid who was positive in class, but they were all masked. We saw less than 1% of those kids get infected. Again, masks working. And so if we take away masks, we're now putting those kids at a very high risk of getting infected 
Um, and without masks, there's going to be needs for either for quarantines. Um, and so again, if you think about those 2000 kids who would be considered close contacts, they're not masked. Those are 2000 additional exclusions for quarantine that we didn't have to do last year. But with current policies moving forward at our schools, if masks are not implemented, we will see high rates of exclusions for quarantines, and certainly we will see quite a bit of infections, um, particularly with Delta circulating at the level that it is. Um, as of today, we have 125 Delta cases that have been confirmed, um, but the percentage of our cases that are coming back as Delta are really quite high, um, and it is without a doubt the dominant strain here in Johnson County. So with that, I will um, hand it off to Charlie to talk about what our guidance is for the school year, schools this year. All right, well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And you know, here we are approaching the school year and we're in a very different place than we were a year ago. Uh, back to school time is always an exciting time, uh, but it can also be an anxious time. And this year uh, with, with COVID-19 still in the community, uh, there's, there's continuing reason to, to have some anxiety around that. So as, as has been mentioned before, we've developed uh, guidance for the upcoming school year uh, that we are, are sharing with you all today. And this guidance is really based on a, a multi-layered evidence-based approach with, with four primary strategies, the, the kind of the Swiss cheese approach that Dr. Ariola was talking about earlier. The first strategy is, is, is about vaccination. And we are uh, encouraging schools and the districts to really promote vaccination uh, for uh, the, their faculty and staff and their students and their families. The currently available vaccines that are authorized for COVID-19 are very safe and highly effective. Uh, they help to prevent COVID-19 uh, especially uh, against severe illness and death. Uh, they help uh, uh, protect uh, those uh, persons who are vaccinated, uh, helps protect them from becoming infected and tra transmitting the virus to others. And they help to protect those who are too young to be vaccinated in the community and those who are more vulnerable to serious illness and complications. And we know that as more and more people get vaccinated, the virus is gonna have less opportunity to spread and the risk of outbreaks will go down, the, the things that Elizabeth was talking about. So. We feel that vaccination will help to keep schools open and re we recommend that schools do all they can to promote vaccination among their faculty, staff and eligible students and their families to provide that additional layer of protection. Our second strategy is to uh, require indoor mask wearing among those who are not fully vaccinated. We know that wearing masks while indoors is a critical element of student and staff safety. And Elizabeth alluded to this, but research has consistently demonstrated that proper mask wearing is effective in limiting in-school transmission. So this has looked at, been looked at specifically for the school environment. Even when there's full in-person learning, mask wearing can help prevent the transmission of the virus. And as Elizabeth mentioned, the, our own analysis from the school year last year has shown that masks offer an important line of defense with, with fewer than 1% of, uh, of students who are uh, within three feet of another person uh, who is infected be, uh, then going on to develop infection themselves. So we really feel that this is an important strategy. Uh, the third strategy is to exclude those who either have been suspected or they've been confirmed of having COVID-19 infection. And, and again, any person, including a student, a faculty member, or a staff member who's been diagnosed with COVID-19 infection must be excluded from school and school activities for an appropriate period of isolation. Generally, that's going to be 10 days from when their symptoms began, but those persons must not be in the school uh, environment. And anyone who develops symptoms uh, consistent with COVID-19 should also be excluded from school, and they need to get tested to make sure that, uh, that they're, we're protecting those around them, and, and uh, they should not return until COVID-19 has been in, uh, ruled out. And finally, the, the last strategy, of course, is, is what to do with those persons who have been exposed to COVID-19. And again, any person who is susceptible, and what we mean by that is they've not been vaccinated, and they have not had confirmed COVID-19 in the last six months, if they've been exposed, regardless of where that exposure occurred, whether it's in the school or it's outside of school in the, in the household, for example, or somewhere else, they must uh, be excluded from school for the appropriate time frame. Uh, and for most people, uh, that could be as soon as eight days. Uh, if they get tested or if they're not tested, they can return uh, on 11, uh, 11 days after uh, they've been exposed. And then finally, additional uh, you know, tried and true public health measures such as hand washing and hand hygiene, uh, you know, covering coughs and sneezes, cleaning and disinfection and, and uh, making sure that there's appropriate ventilation in the schools, all those things can help as well. 
And we feel like with, with these strategies in place, we can keep schools open and have a, a safe and healthy school year. Thank you, Charlie, and, and thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, Teresa, before we go into uh, specific questions, I do want to reiterate uh, a lot of what has been said. We have effective vaccines that are out there. In the United States alone, we have fully vaccinated over 160 million persons. We have given hundreds of millions of these vaccines out across the world. They are not only effective, they are very safe. I read uh, uh, over the weekend stories of different people who had concerns starting uh, earlier on, but then they talked to friends and family members that have been vaccinated, and that prompted them to get vaccinated. A vaccine, uh, it's really unusual to have this many vaccine, uh, these effective vaccines available within a year of dealing with uh, a new, a novel uh, virus like this. So I would say we got very lucky. And so, but we also understand that we have not vaccinated enough persons across the region. I like to say that I like our numbers in Johnson County, but we don't live uh, in an island away from our neighbors across the region. The numbers are not good enough. We also know that the lower the level of transmission, the lower the risk or the higher our chances of keeping our schools open will be. Now we have Delta that is really raging and infecting a lot of people around here. We don't want to lose the gains that we have uh, made because every single person that's infected is giving this virus an opportunity to mutate. Okay, we don't want to, we don't, we don't have the newer ones that, the newer variant that we might be concerned with that uh, may be even more uh, transmissible, may be even more pathogenic, the so-called Omega Again, if we don't have this shot in the arms of as many people as possible, if you don't take these uh, public health interventions of wearing masks, um, we, we're giving the virus an opportunity to, um, to, to, to mutate. And so keep those things in mind. There is this personal benefit or responsibility, but there's also the community responsibility that, that we have to ourselves. We don't have an approved vaccines for anyone that's younger than 12. We need to protect them. If you and I get vaccinated, we are protecting them. If you and I wear masks, we are protecting them. So it is very important in our schools to keep those things in mind. And for those students who are listening to us, who are 12 or older, work with your parents, get vaccinated. And we know that we part of our efforts to start last year was uh, to vaccinate a lot of the staff and faculty. And we did a good job doing that. Those are positives, but moving forward, to keep our students in school, to keep our schools safe and health, healthful, we need to do these things. We need to vaccinate. We need to wear a mask. We need to exclude people that are sick. That's the way to go to keep our schools open. Thank you. Theresa, I know you have some questions there. We're very happy to take. We're, we're seeing lots of discussion on, on social media, as you might imagine, about um, recommendations to mask children once again. Um, we're also seeing some discussion about the vaccine itself and the safety of it for children 12 and older. And so we wanted to, of course, provide this opportunity to, to talk really about some of the um, those, those concerns and and how effective the, the vaccine is for that age group as well. Uh, uh, I'm happy, happy to take that. That's, uh, so um, the, the Food and Drug Administration is really the agency that um, approves and oversees the trials of, of these vaccines. Um, one thing that we need to uh, be clear is that uh, the technology for that's used for the uh, mRNA vaccines, for example, um, the sci scientists have been working on that for a few decades now. And so it's, 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 not, it's not necessarily new. Um, uh, and vaccines are not brought to the market until they are tested in several, several people over, over different times. By the time we got the approval for Moderna and Pfizer, they've been tested in tens of thousands of people. And even now what we have is the, what is called the emergency use authorization. And, and that uh, when it gets to uh, uh, full approval, which uh, they've applied for, that will have been tested now in millions of people. Uh, 
I don't think you ever see this kind of data where you have vaccines that have been given to hundreds of millions of people. That's beyond anything that we have seen before. So the, the safety is, there's no question. I, I'll tell you the other data that we're seeing right now is even with breakthrough infections in people that are fully uh, uh, immunized, you are seeing remarkable uh, strength in withstanding severe illnesses, hospitalizations, and death. A few months ago, we were seeing tens of deaths in our population older than 65. We're not seeing those, okay? So right now, our hospitalization is driven by those that are unvaccinated. Across the country, it's over 90%, over 97% to be more precise. And that's similar to what we are seeing around here. So the other piece to, to the other thing to keep in mind is the, the, the doses are necessarily different. So FDA typically would, would uh, treat those that are 12 to 17 as extension of the adult population. Those that are slightly younger, the dose, it could be, um, it could be uh, 10 milligrams uh, uh, per, uh, per, per liter rather than 30. And so, the, and, and I, I think the ones that are younger than, than six, they're looking at about three milligrams for them. So the dose is important, but those have to be tested. That's why we don't have approval for those that are younger than two because they're not trying to use the adult data to predict what will happen in that younger population. I think the expectation is those data will be submitted to FDA by September, and hopefully we have um, approval for those uh, sometimes in the winter months. So again, these things are tested for efficacy. They're tested for safety. The, uh, uh, the data, the results have to favor way heavily on the side of efficacy and safety with minimal risk before these things are approved. But again, I'm gonna push that out that we have given this to hundreds of millions of people across the world. It's proven to be very safe. It's proven to be very effective. And if I can follow up with Dr. Ariola, um, I know there are concerns about side effects um, of parents in this age group and I want to hopefully dispel some of the myths. It's going to one of the points that Dr. Ariola made, which is the sheer number of people who have been vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the 12 to 17-year-olds, I believe, became eligible in May. And so now we've been vaccinating those kids. And there is a rare side effect that you may have heard about with Pfizer in this age group. But when you look at how often that happens versus how often some of the complications of COVID um, in this age group happen, the risk is actually much lower with the vaccine for those side effects than it is if your kid gets COVID-19 through an infection, right? And there are a number of complications. We know that kids do get hospitalized. There is a syndrome called MIS-C, where multi-inflammatory syndrome in children that can cause a lot of different um, issues in the, in the body. It can cause heart issues. It can cause pancreas issues. It can cause multiple different um, systems in your body to, to act unusually um, and can cause hospitalizations and some long-term effects. And then the other piece that is still really fuzzy for us is about this long COVID, um, which you've heard a lot about, I'm sure. And we know that it definitely affects adults. Um, there is some data that it affects kids. We just don't really have a good handle on how often that happens. Um, but we've actually seen this kind of syndrome in other um, SARS viruses too, like the original SARS from the early 2000s, as well as MERS. So, you know, even when kids get sick, I think there's sort of this um, idea that kids are fine when they come out of it, and, and many will be, yes, but not all of them. And so the question, you know, for me as a parent, my child uh, will likely be eligible when they come out with the vaccine is, where am I, what am I comfortable with the risk? Um, and so I think that definitely for me personally, the risk is higher if my kid gets COVID. I don't know about long COVID. I don't know if he's gonna have any effects long-term that are gonna affect his cognitive ability. Um, whereas I know that for the vaccine, at least the evidence out of the 12 to 17 year olds is that the risk for side effects are very, very rare. So I'm um, trying to dispel some of the myths that, you know, when you see these numbers and you see them on social media about the number of, you know, deaths that people are claiming to be associated with the vaccine, you really have to think about the denominator, right? And in the US, we have vaccinated 161 million residents with the COVID vaccine. Um, and so when you start looking at, at what that looks like, it's a very, very small percentage. All right, thank you for that. And we're seeing quite a bit of debate too about on social media about natural immunity. And if you get COVID, how long are you protected there versus if you get the vaccine? 
Uh, I'll start and let uh, Charlie or Elizabeth also also join in. Um, so so when, when we started the response uh, based on uh, information, again, uh, we need to remind people that um, we're still learning and um, this is only the second year of dealing with this virus. We uh, were assuming that uh, based on available information that um, the immune response uh, elicited uh, naturally from infection uh, will last about three months. Now, now we're doing six months. Uh, but, but here's the thing. We know that um, the uh, vaccines elicit a lot more immune response than uh, natural infection does. Uh, sometimes three times more, sometimes up to 10 times more. And so um, uh, there's no question that the recommendation from uh, uh, CDC is that uh, even with natural infection, uh, that you should you should get vaccinated. It does elicit uh, some immune response. It's just not as robust as you would from from getting vaccinated. All right, thank you for that. Uh, another question, and maybe Charlie, if you want to take this one, is uh, you know we were kind of tracking or providing some opportunities for educators and other school staff members early on in. Um, when we were vaccinating to get their vaccinations. And so how important is it that the staff members in the school system get their vaccine? Well, absolutely, you know, I, I've always viewed schools as kind of being at the heart of the community. And so they, they need to be a, a, a safe and healthy place for, uh, for our children to be. And I just wanna reiterate that we know that COVID-19 vaccines are very safe, they're highly effective, and they'll help protect not only the these teachers and other staff in the school from getting infected themselves, but they are also then helping to protect those in the community, including children. And, and again, at this point, uh, children under the age of 12 are not eligible to be vaccinated. But if those teachers and staff members are getting vaccinated, they are helping to protect those uh, those children and others in the community who, who either cannot get vaccinated or they might be at, at risk uh, for severe complications from, from the illness. And, and again, we know that as more and more people get vaccinated, the risk of transmission is going to go down and we're going to we're going to see fewer outbreaks and so vaccination is key to keeping schools open in a safe and healthy manner and so we just we really encourage uh, everyone who can take the vaccine to get it all right thank you very much and elizabeth uh, we talked earlier about some of the the increases that we're seeing in cases are the original concern with the pandemic was that would create some strain on our healthcare system so are we starting to see some of that now you know, we are starting to see an uptick in hospitalizations in the red region. Um, some of this is likely due to the situation in Southwest Missouri, where their hospitals are overwhelmed and there are no more places for those patients to go. Um, and so they are sending them up here. But we have seen um, a slight increase in hospitalizations. And if you recall from early days in the pandemic, we used to talk about how hospitalizations were what we call a lagging indicator, meaning we're going to see sort of an increase in our cases first. And then within a couple of weeks, we'll see that increase in hospitalizations. And that's really the tricky thing with this virus is um, once you start seeing evidence of transmission in the community, so those cases go up, that percent positive goes up, it's really too late to prevent those hospitalizations. And Dr. Ariel is correct. For the most part, almost everybody we're seeing in the hospital and certainly in the ICU um, are unvaccinated. You know, we've had a number of individuals under the age of 50 who have died as of late um, due to COVID-19 and they were not vaccinated. So. Um, it is something that we will continue to, to keep an eye on. I don't think that we will see quite the, the level we saw last fall in particular, um, but given what's happened in Southwest Missouri, where their vaccination rates are significantly lower than ours, um, but we live in a, in a metro region where there's variable vaccination coverage levels. So um, we'll be continuing to watch it, but certainly the best way to protect, protect yourself from being hospitalized, um, ending up, up in that ICU, and certainly death is through vaccination. All right. And I know we talked about the Delta variant, but I've heard some sort of conflicting information here and there, uh, you know, on social media about whether the vaccines that exist right now are effective in pre preventing illness with, with the Delta variant. Right. So I think the, the simple answer to that is, is yes. Um, evidence from across the, the world is showing that the, the vaccines are effective in preventing uh, severe illnesses, hospitalizations, and death uh, uh, related to uh, elicited by the Delta variant. We also know that those that are vaccinated uh, also have reduced uh, chances of spreading that. Now, 
uh, uh, because uh, uh, at least in theory, we know that exposure to uh, infection by the Delta uh, variant probably elicits more viral load. So maybe um, depends uh, on um, uh, the ability to spread. Again, um, the, 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 we have a vaccine that's effective. There's no question about that. Uh, we still don't have a variant that is not, um, uh, uh, that the vaccines are not currently covering. However, the more opportunity that we have, we give to this virus to spread, especially since we still have a lot of our population not vaccinated, the more opportunity we give for the for variants that may be more pathogenic and definitely more transmissible. So um, we have a lot of work to do. To do. But again, because we are talking lightly about our schools today, uh, we do want to reemphasize that our goal last year, our goal now is to keep our schools open. And I think that's a shared goal that we have with our school superintendents. It's a shared goal with our, our school boards. It's a shared goal with our commissioners and, uh, the, uh, and also with our parents. Parents obviously have a role to play as you are listening to us to um, encourage your children to wear, to wear masks. Uh, going by the data that we saw in this summer months, when outdoor activity is encouraged, um, we are worried about what will transpire in the fall and winter months when we spend more time indoor in an environment that's pretty conducive for the virus to spread. We have seen outbreaks, like Elizabeth said, in camps, church camps, other, other camps in the summer, uh, childcare establishment, uh, and that's worrisome. And so uh, we know that masks work. Uh, and we've emphasized that. So uh, parents can um, uh, assist and in ensuring that we keep our schools open by ensuring that their children wear masks. They can assist in ensuring that we keep our schools open by keeping their children home when they are sick. They can also assist in ensuring that we keep our schools open by taking their children for testing when they have symptoms that are consistent with this or when they are a close contact of somebody. That's a part, although you can always quarantine without the test, like uh, Charlie said. But all of those uh, uh, cooperating with our contact tracing efforts with schools, all, the, all of those are very important. Of course, our letter and the guidance is sent to the school boards and the school superintendents to clearly understand things that are very, very important for us to um, keep our schools safe, to keep our children healthy, and to keep our schools open. Vaccinate more people, that's a plus. You can't go wrong with wearing masks. But when there are infections, there will be infections, especially at the start of the school year, given the summer activity, to work with the health, uh, Department of Health and Environment in isolating cases and exclusion and quarantining close contacts. Those are things that we must do to keep our schools open. And I know we put out some some guidance or uh, recommendations jointly with our regional partners on Friday as well. Can you talk a little bit about what that message was? Yes. So the um, like um, uh, Charlie and Elizabeth said earlier, uh, the concern about uh, the Delta variant and the and the spike in the number of infections and increases in hospitalizations is across the region, it's, it's across the country really. Hospitals are, uh, that were seeing two patients uh, several weeks ago, COVID patients a week, are now seeing tens of such pa patients. So they're concerned and we are too. Now, we also know that uh, the, on the positive side, is because our older population, the more vulnerable population are largely vaccinated. Uh, uh, luckily, we are not seeing that level of death or hospitalization, but we are seeing hospitalizations in younger people. Uh, the, the other part also is that uh, breakthrough infections are being seen in individuals that are maybe uh, undergoing uh, cancer treatment. <coughs> maybe um, uh, organ, uh, uh, having organ transplant, otherwise taking medications that could uh, 
impact the ability of their system to elicit the right level of immune response. If you are in those categories, even if you are fully vaccinated, wear a mask. That was part of the guidance to some updated information about those with weakened immune systems and some of the extra precautions that they may want to take. So Charlie, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, again, just going back to some of the things we talked about earlier and the importance of, of getting the vaccination levels up in the community to help protect uh, those who are, cannot be vaccinated or those who uh, are more vulnerable and, and may not have an, uh, as strong of an immune response to the vaccine as, as others might. And so again, encourage that, uh, very important. The other thing, of course, is for uh, those who have not been vaccinated to, to wear masks. To, again, uh, that will help protect those in the community who are, who are more vulnerable. So for those people who are in that category of, of uh, having a weakened immune system and being more vulnerable to, uh, to the severe complications, you know, very simple uh, approaches uh, to, to prevention would be to avoid indoor crowded places. Uh, even if you've been fully vaccinated, but you're vul more vulnerable, uh, taking advantage of, of uh, you know, curbside pickup and, and other services that, that, uh, that were implemented uh, over the last uh, year to year and a half or so. And also to continue to wear a mask uh, when you have to be out in public uh, because uh, the, you know, other people wearing masks will protect you and, and the mask will also help you protect yourself uh, to some degree as well. And so with those common sense uh, uh, precautions, uh, we, can, we can help reduce the risk to those who are most vulnerable. All right, great information. And before we wrap up, um, I just want to have us reiterate the importance of getting tested um, and, and getting vaccinated and that those opportunities still exist, even though we kind of scaled back a little bit when things started slowing down. So um, if you could talk about where people can still get their tests and well, where people can still get vaccinated. I'll let Elizabeth take that here. Absolutely. Um, so testing is still readily available. Um, we have testing clinic right now on Wednesdays that you can go onto our website and sign up for that. Um, also go get tested.com, come back KC, also have testing sites as well as a number of our pharmacies um, are offering testing too. Um, if you are sick, you know, we would recommend you get a PCR test. It's probably gonna take a day to send that off, but it's, it's a better test than the antigen test or those rapid tests. Um, and then as for vaccinations, again, lots of opportunities. Um, our Lenexa clinic is still open um, and we have walk-in appointments. We're also out in the community, hy V, Walmart, CVS, you know, there's vaccines are readily available pretty much anywhere. Um, again, if you are a parent of a kiddo 12 to 17, you're gonna need the Pfizer vaccine. So if you're gonna go someplace, we have that at Johnson County, but if you're gonna go to a pharmacy, you may just wanna call ahead and make sure that that's what they have there so that your ch child can get it when you show up. All right, sounds good. So lots of opportunities still out there. And of course, you can go to our website to get more information about those. Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Yes, um, again, to um, our, our school board, our superintendents and our parents, uh, we started um, uh, working very, very early with our superintendents last year. Um, our goal was to keep our, our students in school and keep them safe. And I believe that we, we achieved that. And, and that's what we're trying to do this year. Um, we have a, a variant that's uh, concerning to us that spreads easily. And, and there are some common sense steps that we took last, last year that if we do again this year, in addition to vaccination, we'll ensure that we do that. And that's what we're asking you to do to ensure that um, uh, teachers and students, especially those that are unvaccinated, wear masks. An added advantage to being vaccinated is even if you are a close contact of, of someone, we're not excluding you because you are vaccinated. And I believe that we're also doing that consistent with CDC's recommendation for those that are wearing masks. And so if you're wearing masks, even when you are uh, uh, at, uh, three feet away from somebody, you will not be excluded. You will not be considered a close contact. Of course, all of this depends on if you start showing symptoms, we do want you to monitor that and get tested. But again, uh, there are just so many options and everything that we put forward to you is consistent with KDHE and CDC's guidelines. 
let's do it. Let's take the right steps. As we get more of the vaccine into the arms of more people, we are going to find out some of this may not be needed on the long run, but we do need to do that. Thank you for working with us. We will do more of the Facebook Live and provide more information as they become available. But the next few weeks, uh, uh, getting ready for school, parents listening, go and get your child vaccinated. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, watching today and for providing some great information. And of course, go to our website, jococov.org forward slash coronavirus. And there you can uh, get information about testing, about getting vaccinations. And then also you can read that school guidance for yourself. So again, thank you all for joining us and have a great day.